Welcome to our webinar, Managing Large Amounts of Data with Salesforce. SenseCorp has been around for over two decades, offering a variety of consulting services across data, digital, and business transformation. Our team of skilled consultants offers insights and solutions to the most important problems facing business and government. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Paul McCollum, a very early computing adopter. Paul has been programming for almost 40 years, writing his first lines of code in the second grade. The past 20 years have been focused on the portal space, starting by hand with Notepad and VI. He has served as an enterprise architect and application development leader in retail, banking, real estate, and telecom. His current focus is around empowering power users and IT pros with scalable development solutions or with highly accessible JavaScript and Salesforce. Okay, thanks everyone for attending. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Paul, the floor is yours. Ah, thank you very much, Kelly. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, as she mentioned, I have been an uh, enterprise architect for some years and I'm looking forward to talking to everybody uh, about maturing um, your solution architecture practice to <clears throat> the larger Salesforce ecosystem. Um, about me, I've been working for SenseCorp for almost a year now. Um, it's been an exciting join. They are uh, developing major eminence inside of the Salesforce and data fields, which are um, really powerful aspects and, and constant uh, topics for uh, design considerations and modern application. So <clears throat> what we're gonna go over in this uh, seminar uh, is about leveling up your, your solution architecture skills to bring in some enterprise architecture uh, awareness and patterns and start to plan for them. Uh, we're gonna look, talk about mapping data at scale, uh, both migration and ongoing. Will my application fit long-term in my target architecture so that you're not designing uh, a mouse architecture with an elephant uh, appetite? And do I have any design skews? And we'll be talking about what is a design skew in the next slide, but where will my pain points be? What things will I have to solve for as soon as this application starts up and people start putting data into it? And will it fit? So we're talking about pain points and solution patterns for lots of data, lots of connections, or lots of connections to a lot of data sources. <laughs> So some of these terms like large data volume can be imprecise and it's <clears throat> have lots of different meanings. So your mileage may vary on what some of the definitions are and, and where uh, you may be looking for or dealing with problems for large data. And this we're gonna be focusing specifically on data and integration issues in the design phase uh, and discussing some of the solution platforms specifically. Uh, we're not gonna go into remediation uh, necessarily, and we're not going to cover some of the other aspects of more than just an overview of, of where they might be. So talking about architecture, and it's not just solution design, but solution architecture, uh, you need to be aware of as soon as you build your application that somebody may have plans for it that you did not. And if you don't plan for those, an application that's immediately engaged by the business team and doesn't do what they were thinking it would do, um, is a failure. And you need to be able to guess that, assume that, build for that, be prepared, and predict that future of consumption that isn't necessarily what your initial SOW or your initial plan was. Um, good architecture is responsible for the ultimate success of the application and project. And one of the, the guiding rules, or at least one of the, the missives that uh, should keep you uh, dialed into what it means to have good architecture. Uh, in relative dollars, it's one dollar to effectively design and architect a solution, uh, but the cost to redesign it due to technical debt, if it's not architected well, is tenfold, and then to completely scrap and retool it is a hundredfold, and then if you're the person who built a solution that had to be uh, written off or completely scrapped, the damage to your reputation really can't be quantified. Um, I've been on a lot of projects that have, have run into that. Uh, one of my favorite nightmare stories was the development of an application uh, that had one data source connection to one cloud provider. And in the midst of some of the agile design, the data connections increased by a factor of about 40, which led to a 
uh, I was almost, it was five or six fold increase in project cost. The project went from a $500,000 project to a $2.2 million project uh, with annual spend, not just initial spend. Um, that was not a successful project. Uh, it did not complete and it led to a horrible relationship between uh, the vendor uh, and the business. So uh, you definitely want to be prepared, see all of these things and know that um, planning your architecture is vital. You don't just solve the problem end to end and whenever yes or hello ends up on the screen, you're done. You have to be prepared for all of the end-to-end -end costs, operational and so forth. So within Salesforce, we're used to building applications. We create pages, buttons, flows, validation rules, uh, and we're talking to objects and fields. And then we might combine it with talking to uh, authentication systems like Active Directory, OAuth, uh, or other SSO models, or maybe pulling in some HR profile data, medical history, order history, and so forth. Um, those are well and good and, and components of, of every Salesforce project, but you have to be aware, and most Salesforce application designers know that too many of anything can be bad. Uh, Salesforce has imposed a limit of 100 validation rules on an object. Um, if your application design <laughs> calls for 100 validation rules, you've got something you're not handling well. Um, if you've ever tried to create te test data, create test data on an object that had 100 validation rules, it is a nightmare. Um, and you know Salesforce had to put that validation limit in there because somebody tried to do it with 200. Um, I can think of five or six for any particular piece of data, but getting out to 100 validation rules um, means something is, is really wrong or you're trying to do way too much with too little. Uh, so those are the kinds of, um, that's an example of the kind of skew that we're talking about where you've got too much complexity writing in one particular component of your design. So we're trying to build and understand how our applications look at a component scale. Um, the relative complexity and magnitude of downstream data, not because data is bad, but because handling lots of anything has a cost. And especially if it's out of line with the cost of your application, you can't build a simple app with a massive database uh, connectivity pattern behind it or requires hundreds and thousands of web service calls and still call it a cheap and simple app. Um, so for our purposes, design skew is defined, is defined as having components out of proportion with each other. Uh, skew can cause both system and operational degradation. <clears throat> so it's not just the cost of the connections, but having a network team involved constantly or um, other development teams or data teams involved constantly based on dependencies downstream for other data, you have to be aware that that's a huge cost or can be a huge cost and make sure that you're planning for it and aware of it. Uh, another thing to be aware of as we're going forward, I'm just gonna mention it casually here, uh, master data. Be aware if you are creating master data as part of one of your designs. So even though your application may be fine and its scale, if you're creating something that other people need, then they may be consuming your application and that could add to complexity. Um, also, you may need to ship your data out to uh, the owner of a master data uh, system. Or if you've got good uh, MDM management, hopefully that exists and or you may be copying master logic. So if you're building a simple logic on maybe the uh, tax calculation, if it the, um, any of the, the trendy formulas that might be slightly different rounding rules in different areas or different calculation types or reporting, uh, you need to be aware that those are, um, could be chained to other systems and then cause you to have to deal with that complexity later. Again, it's not that any of this is bad, it just, if, as long as you're aware of it and you build to it, uh, you're in, you can still be in good shape. So some common types of design skew, and we're not gonna go too deep into any of these in particular. Um, oops, sorry. And this is just my archetype of, of connections and connectivity. So we'll be using these, arc, these icons and this uh, sketch drawing of functional users, application functionality, internal data storage, 
service consumptions and or systems, and then data consumption and or systems. So we'll be reusing these icons as we talk about data architecture. Uh, it's probably oversimplified, uh, but it's at least a good place to start um, as you're trying to look for design SKUs in your application. So if you uh, fairly commonly solved um, excess, excess user demand, um, one of the, uh, the big things, and it's, it goes back a, a ways, when uh, people were building up their news applications or they were trying to write their own blog posts and they wanted their blogs to be viewed by everybody and they finally had a newsworthy item um, for their post, for their news system, for their blog, one of the big news aggregators, Slashdot, if they published a link to that particular blog, probably a fourth of them would go down as soon as people, as soon as it was published on Slashdot. Uh, it was, came, became referred to as slash dotting. Um, and so people who are wanting this popularity had ad revenue that would be driven off of the popularity because their system wasn't prepared for the amount of load when they actually got what they wanted, their system went down. Um, so that would be a huge loss from anything if you're not prepared and ready um, for instant demand and scale. and if that's part of your, um, if that's part of your value ge generation, then you need to be ready for that inside of your design. Um, too much data, too many objects, massive schema. Uh, you might want to look at a, a enterprise uh, data warehousing or refactor the application or refactor the data schema um, or application complexity. You may need to look at modularizing it. Um, if you're deploying code and everything seems to break, any change to anything seems to break. Uh, everything else. So again, just quick types of design SKUs that probably most everybody is at least casually familiar with. <clears throat> so starting with mapping your application, um, using again these same icons, sketch the user counts, sketch out user types, sketch all the list out all the functions that you're trying to build, all the applications, especially connectivity. I've seen uh, more than a few projects fail uh, as in the trial by firewall, uh, having to staff a network team or network team members uh, just to make the bare minimums of an application work, uh, domains, URLs, certificates, and data sources. So make sure that all of those that you need for success are in your application and you <clears throat> because you'll need to be designing uh, for any failures. If there's connectivity failures, if you're not able to troubleshoot, then you're going to have a problem and your application is going to sit dead in the water for way too long. But make sure you draw this up, uh, design it, keep it accurate, and attach it to every deploy and code review. Make sure your developers are aware that there is a limit on the number of service calls that you're expecting this application to consume and that there are only two data sources they are supposed to get data from. Uh, changes are inevitable, uh, but as long as they're, they're uh, vocalized, then you will end up in good shape and you won't have major problems. I've had more than a couple problems where projects where developers have connected to better sources of data or faster sources of data, but didn't go back and, and have the entire project reroute to that data and then you got compete and two different sources of truth, which is something you don't want to be dealing with or telling somebody why the data is wrong on one page and right on another. Uh, so we've included this uh, architecture worksheet where you can go through and just uh, write your notes down, start there, and make sure that you're passing that around. It's a good, <clears throat> good high-level design document to have with your project so that everybody's on the same page with how it's laid out from a large scale. And you might want to put in, if you're dealing with uh, license costs between a service provider and data, or whether you know you're at a governor limit, to make sure that people that are designing know that they've only got X number of calls to X number of service that they can do per second, and make sure that those are listed here um, along with all of the other uh, details of the application. So we'll make this worksheet available. It's just something I used to, um, keep notes and keep very high level pictures of how an application is working and manage changes to it. So when, uh, so this is a simple kind of basic architecture design. Now some of the more reference architectures that you get in the, the real world look a, a little bit different. We'll start, um, you'll have stuff come into play. So our uh, MuleSoft and Jitterbit uh, doing uh, API orchestration, Kafka for streaming and data. 
uh, data lake storage where you're consuming from a pool of databases as opposed to an individual data source or data mart. Um, whether that data is going to be um, sent out to an ODS like Snowflake uh, for reporting. And then, oops, hop back to that. And then Tableau fits into this also for uh, um, analytics and development. So be aware that this is what a real world architecture could look like and you'll need to adapt your, uh, your basic design to deal with all of these different possible components. If there's DAM, SFTP, ETL systems, NoSQL, you need to map those and understand the constraints around each one of those systems um, as you design your application and make sure you distribute them, especially in the time of distributed teams and third party vendors, it's really important to have high level design constraints and non-functional requirements uh, visible and published to all teams. So uh, our steps for <clears throat> whenever you're trying to map out um, design SKUs and or um, the size and shape of your application, step one, dream big. Visualize success. How big will this get? How many people will use this? If it gets to X size, will I have to rebuild it? So define growth boundaries and recommended changes. Create transactional warning systems inside triggers and functions. And this is just a, a little pseudocode snippet. Uh, if your data, if your DML size is close to 70% of your limit, then you start, need to start sending warnings to your admins that you're about to overflow your governor limits and stuff may stop working uh, as you design. Um, so it's, it's hard refactoring stuff to meet DML limits. It's even harder when you're doing it while the system is down and money is being lost. So hitting these, starting to knowing where these limits might be, where they might pop up and getting an alert that you need to start solving them before the system crashes can be a huge success factor or reputation saver if you've ever sat behind your application that's not working because you didn't build it for the scale of the success you were supposed to be. So step two, dream even bigger. Um, so not only could your application explode, could the uses for your application explode beyond what you were uh, building it for? Does the data I'm gathering, am I creating master data? Like mentioned earlier. Um, if you're creating master data, then every other system in the company that needs that or in the whatever ecosystem you're building to is going to need to come and consume that. Um, those objects, your simple objects, may need to be exported daily, weekly, hourly, um, or even real time consumed by other applications so that they have your source of truth. Um, so the a good key is the larger the volume is, of data is created, the more likely there will be in value, uh, there'll be value in analyzing the data. Uh, trends, next specs, actions, um, if you're suggesting stuff to uh, people that are buying or acting, what they should do next, that involves having uh, some kind of a machine learning or AI looking at your data, trying to find trends and suggesting next trends. There is a lot of crunch involved with doing that. Uh, that you'll need to be prepared for if your application is providing that kind of uh, mass data and therefore extra value that can be consumed from it and will instantly want to be. So <clears throat> as you're creating data, think of all the possible ways it could be used and then plan accordingly. So uh, one of the design SKUs we'll be talking about, we'll zooming in on, is too many records. Uh, their Salesforce has actually started to make acquisitions and suggest uh, some reference enterprise architectures around the impl implementation of their tool at large scales. Uh, Salesforce does what it does very well, but everybody has been on a project or everybody's had a need to reach out to some other um, service or application or data source to bring that in to give context to the data um, and or make use of existing data and bring it in into a mashup application situation. So <clears throat> uh, schema overload and record overload are two big ways that uh, that you can hit uh, design skew issues by <clears throat> trying to keep a perfect twin with reality or not having a plan to make data, have data mature out of the system. So if you're keeping forensic records, if you're doing anything with money, you're probably keeping every single record uh, transaction there so that if somebody comes back and says, I didn't pay for that, I didn't ask for that, I didn't order that, you can go back and say, well, it came from this IP address on this date and that's you. 
or hey, no, that's clearly not you, let's get you a refund. That data is assumed to be there around all financial transactions. Um, you're probably, you may be keeping it, um, but you've got to have a plan to keep it and be able to use it and not have it skew your system. So <clears throat> too many records, one of those things, one of the solves for those records or having too many records is big objects. Big objects is Salesforce in-platform implementation of NoSQL, no which gets into the millions and millions of records, can handle a lot of records, but NoSQL comes with its own drawbacks. It is not the same as just having a large object. Um, it can't be referenced and joined in the same exact ways. Uh, you have to pay extra, I think, if you actually want to query against it. Um, it is for supporting large demand on things, um, but it is not transact optimized. So you may not get the exact um, value you're looking for when you run it if you're going against NoSQL because it's kind of uh, because it's spread out for performance. So Salesforce, this is taken directly from Salesforce's recommendation on one of their sites and the URLs down at the bottom, has put together a flow chart of when to use it. Um, and this is great. Uh, I'm, I'm loving seeing architecture patterns come out of Salesforce. Um, Unfortunately, it's, this is an in-platform architecture pattern design, and we'll be getting to a little bit more of the other ones that are out of system. So um, great little flow chart here for big objects and when to use them. 20 million records are key points. Uh, does your data need to be exposed in a customer facing mobile app? Another huge point. And when to pull it off, Heroku Connect, another data proxy. So. Um, Hopefully we'll be seeing more and more guidance like this around the, uh, the applications that uh, Salesforce buys, but uh, we're including some of our own and some of the rest of the slides here. So other options for storing big data and having schema overload and, and uh, record overload um, is moving your data out to a data lake or a cloud data warehouse. Um, so we this is our kind of table of guidance on when to use NoSQL versus when to use a cloud data warehouse. Um, so if you're not really using the data very often and, it's, and you won't need to go in and do regular forensics and you know that your growth rate is gonna be kind of at a fixed rate and you have the ability to delete records as time goes on, you don't have to keep them forever um, or you're not SOX compliant to, and have to, uh, or it's not, uh, relevant to SOX control, you can go through and delete that data and don't have to keep it for five to seven years. Um, if you do keep it that long and don't have a plan for it to, to move on, uh, then you can get hit with some serious storage fees and you'll really want to consider moving it out to a cheaper storage location like a data lake or cloud data warehouse. Um, if you already have an ODS available, definitely push it um, uh, out to the data warehouse and no, don't have to deal with that headache in your design. Uh, just shunt the data out and put it in the major pool. Um, if you have, if you're developing master data, um, but you need <clears throat> ETL or other data in, um, yeah, sorry, excuse me, I lost my track on that. So. Oh, if you have to, so, well, that's really a reason not to use big, so I need to move that over there. Um, if other data is required for, uh, from external systems uh, for it to have context, that's a reason you would not want to use NoSQL. Uh, anytime you're uh, looking at analytics for um, uh, multiple sources, uh, you definitely want to be in a, in a more um, device or a uh, ecosystem agnostic uh, location like a data lake to where you can mash up two pieces together, two pieces of data or two source data, pieces of data uh, together in a data warehouse as opposed to only having uh, Salesforce data. Uh, don't bring data into Salesforce just to pour, perform calculations on it. Um, it's okay at that, but it's definitely not a system that was tuned um, for running calculations. NoSQL is about available. It's not about uh, being crunchable or referable. Um, so yeah, and if you expect it to grow infinitely, don't store there, that's right optimized. The cloud data warehouse, if you, the key marker, if you get close or think you're gonna be close to one terabyte of data, uh, you need to be out of Salesforce. You need to have a plan, um, watch your trends, see if you're growing, if you're heading that way, if you're six months in and you're, um, 
200 gig of, of data, then you need to start pumping that data out and have a plan for that. Um, so what you need to be successful with either one of these is have operational and administrative diligence, uh, managing the size, load, and license costs on big objects. Uh, for data lake and cloud data warehouse, it's definitely something that a more mature organization um, would take on. So you need to have a healthy cloud management presence uh, or engagement. Uh, I think since Corp, sorry. <coughs> uh, so licensing, um, the licensing on, uh, on NoSQL is extra, but it's uh, scalable in chunks, uh, and it seems reasonable unless you are really planning to overload it. Um, the data lake and cloud data warehouse licensing is consumption-based and can scale a lot better uh, with larger uh, amounts of data. Uh, both of those, both of those solutions have their more than just the amount of. Uh, excuse me the amount of uh, caveats that are listed here, but this is a start on when to know which one you're gonna be looking at. Uh, MuleSoft and Jitterbit. So these are both um, loosely termed API orchestration platforms. If you are dealing with lots of data connections in between your systems, you need to look at having a managed middleware layer that, ha that helps uh, orchestrate uh, manage, control, and secure from a stability and uptime perspective uh, your dependencies and connections. So if you're hooked to a data service provider that's constantly changing, like I said, if you're connected to uh, Oracle or Service Bus that is constantly having changes done to it, uh, you'll want something in the middle that manages when those changes are deployed and rolled out uh, and, and be able to version them and quickly roll them back if the data is not there. Um, again, having an application that is dependent on uh, a lot of external data connections, you'll want to start looking at MuleSoft or Jitterbit or any other in those places. Uh, Salesforce has just acquired MuleSoft, so it's probably a first uh, tier application if you're looking inside the Salesforce ecosystem. Um, but, <clears throat> but if uptime is a primary concern and you are heavily dependent on uh, connections to data sources, you definitely want to look into one of these earlier as opposed to later. Uh, this is a situation where if you're, if you're backtracking or if you have multiple development teams trying to solve a single problem that got introduced by a change, uh, rolling it back, re-implementing, um, or making changes that have impact downstream with the rest of the application, uh, little bits, tiny, uh, tiny dependency problems uh, can take days to solve. So. Uh, hopping to one of these as soon as you realize you are in a dependent situation uh, will be big. So uh, both of these systems are still new. Uh, they are, and, and, and by that they are bespoke. They don't have a an existing uh, language or methodology that you can just retask somebody to go do. It is a their set skills. Um, so you need to. Uh, you'll need to train and get people into uh, positions where they can manage and, and maintain these. So administrators uh, that are specifically skilled in these uh, API orchestration tools are uh, absolutely required. Uh, the licensing on these all over the place. It's really per need. Um, there's nothing you can really say. It's uh, Most of them have a, a small uh, barrier of entry to get into that makes it not cheap to start. Uh, but after that, it can be consumption-based and, and grow with your business as you need it. Uh, Snowflake and Tableau, uh, both of which uh, have been recently included in Salesforce ecosystem. Um, to heavy extents, we have uh, we've seen a lot of uh, connectivity between uh, Snowflake uh, and Salesforce and the purchase of Tableau uh, that makes these ideal candidates for building into your ecosystem. So when to hop to uh, an ODS like Snowflake for reporting. Um, if you are using, if, if you, if demographics and analytics are a key part of your business, you need to be stepping out of the basic analytics offered by Salesforce and into a more mature product like Snowflake or Tableau. Um, if you're trying to run heavy real-time calculations, you definitely be, want to be in, in a Tableau. And these aren't competes uh, where you'd use Snowflake versus Tableau. Um, these are pretty different offerings. Um, 
even though we've got them listed side by side, that's when you want to be engaging with each one of these. It's not an either or situation. It's probably a both in most cases. So you'll see that the when to use recommendations will line up um, with both of these products and they are a really good one-two punch that we uh, deploy fairly regularly at SenseCorp. So if your needs are subject to change and scalability is, con is a concern, uh, then Snowflake, the cloud-based data lake and ODS system will be something you wanna be in almost immediately. Uh, it will help your third party consumptions, um, get to data, share data, and move it around and or manage it at large scales. Uh, so that's what it's built for. So it can take the design skew out of a lot of the analytic or data management side um, application constraints that you're trying to mitigate here. Uh, Tableau, similar. Um, Einstein Analytics, really good for dealing with data inside of Salesforce. Once you need to join multiple source systems, uh, data together, you really want to be looking out at an outside system like Tableau uh, that is built uh, for that. Salesforce is built to do Salesforce data. Um, it's priced, <coughs> excuse me, it's priced to handle uh, the data that's in Salesforce and not really comfortable to try and bring data in just to run calculations on it or just to merge it uh, with other data. That's really the strong suit of Tableau um, and when powered by Snowflake even more so. Um, with Tableau, with, so Snowflake is more of an implementation. It's a, a set it up and you can kind of uh, uh, casually maintain it. Um, it. Tableau is a much more hands-on uh, skill set you'll need if if you're doing regular analytics um, you will want to be building uh, reports on a regular basis and you'll want to have that data literacy skill set the bi skill set and the ui ux skills uh, to build powerful uh, reporting so we've seen people try and implement tableau uh, without having that skill on hand and it can end up being a, a waste of resources uh, so we definitely uh, recommend either letting somebody help you with tableau uh, or skilling up if you're if you need to step into that world. So uh, Tableau is one of those that you can buy separately and run it on premises or in the cloud and the consumption model. Snowflake is entirely cloud. Um, so one of the things one of we're, we're recommending and one of the reasons we're focusing on some of the products we focused on here is because of the moves that Salesforce is making. So if you've got an investment uh, with Salesforce. Um, you definitely want to be watching the uh, the investments and ecosystems there <laughs> that they're making. So, uh, if you were considering going into a a, a report design tool you definitely want to look at the ones that Salesforce is giving a nod to. Like I said, if that's where you've hedged, um, if that's where your investments are, keep an eye on those investments and give those maybe some extra consideration. Um, the stuff that's come out with connectivity to Snowflake um, just recently has been really powerful. Uh, and we've got a handful of experts. I don't know if they're on the call to answer any questions on that, uh, but if you've got any questions for me, um, or if you want me to, uh, to relay questions to our, our Tableau, Snowflake, uh, and data warehouse experts and the, the projects and so forth that they've implemented in the past, I'd be happy to take down names and, uh, and pass those along and get answers for you. Um, that's really all I have, uh, and I'll open it up now, head to back to Kelly and for any uh, questions that anybody has. Thank you, Paul. Let me see. All right, so we do have one question here. Um, can you describe a big object's implementation strategy? Um, I've gotten that a couple of times. Um, it is really hard to say what a big ob object implementation strategy would be without knowing what you're trying to use for it. Um, a simple big object use case uh, would be something like forensic logging or um, I think the big their, their big flagship implementation of, of big objects um, Salesforce's flagship implementation was field service lightning and as they were building out um, all of these um, 
heavy, heavily um, interacted with screens, you know, like uh, um, I did this, I checked that, I checked this, and you're wanting to collect all of those check boxes and when they happened. Even if it's one, just one piece of data on a form, you really want time and date of every single change so that you can go back and check, especially if it's, you know, high sensitivity on things like, um, Healthcare, uh, we checked in on that, or uh, safety issues, power, um, heating and air. If you're sending texts out to do things that are in um, sensitive areas, you really want to journal uh, all of that data out to an easy to revert, but not heavy on joins, nothing that's going to bog down the rest of your application, but able to take all of that data at scale. Um, and then have it be a staging location to either be aged out or moved off to a different system uh, in a more timely fashion. So if you're doing real-time export of data, that could be um, trying to do it synchronously. That could be a pain, uh, and you can do it synchronously into big objects uh, with only a little risk of um, that transactional insecurity that comes with NoSQL and big objects. All right, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions today, so I think we can go ahead and close the webinar and give everyone back a little bit of their afternoon. Um, I do have, I just want to let everybody know that we will be sending out an email with the webinar recording um, and some helpful links in there. Um, if you are watching this webinar as a recording and you have a question that you want to ask, please feel free to email us at marketing at sensecorp.com. We can forward that message to Paul and he can get back to you. Uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out. Again, thanks for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.